welcome back to the Lisa at the Edge podcast. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. Good. Yeah, all good. Thanks for having us again. I really appreciate the effort you guys have gone to for this. This uh, Kenny's even put up his Christmas tree yet. Let's show off our jumpers. Well, it is December. Yeah, it's not, but it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> By the magic of technology, it's December. Yes. Yes. For those listening on the podcast, Kenny is dressed as Santa Claus <laughs> um, <laughs> with a tree in the background. Um, and I've got a Christmas jumper with a candy cane that says, oh, snap, which I like. And a headband that says Jingle Bells. And Darren's rocking a green. What is that? A, is I, that a polar bear? You, you know, so I am uh, giving <laughs> my team all the support they can get right now. There you go. It was, it was the greatest Christmas jumper I had. It is. It is. Yes. It's yep. a Celtic football club Christmas jumper, green with snowflakes, and a polar bear with shades on and a hat. And glasses on. <laughs> Spot the yeah. week. Well, now now I'm glad I didn't wear my blue R two D two Christmas hat because uh, the blue and the green would be in conflict. Yes, it would be in conflict. Yeah. Well done, Kenny. Yeah. It's like we're all on the. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I love the fact that we've got a really good mix of like red, green, gold, and white. It's like the perfect Christmas colours. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so we've actually it's been a while since we've last caught up, right? Because I took a break. Um, so it has been a good few months since we caught up. We've had, I think we've had we've we talked about the Azure Stack HCI announcement. So that was after MS Inspire. But we've obviously had MS Ignite as well. And yeah, a good few months have gone by. Um, so what I want to spend this episode talking about is the imminent launch of Azure Stack HCI. There's still lots of questions coming in around that. Um, so if we could talk a little bit about the use cases for Azure Stack HCI, the commercials and licensing, and just really clarify that. Um, what does disconnected mean or connected mean for Azure Stack HCI? What is what's the the parameters there? And then let's um, let's also talk about Azure Stack Azure Stack Azure Stack on the brain. Um, let's talk about Azure Arc and how Azure Arc now fits into the Azure Stack portfolio. To and and where does it fit? How do they play together? Does that sound like a plan? Sounds marvelous. And then Kenny, I know you've got something really exciting you want to talk about. WS Lab. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, okay, we'll do that. And the 2008 update came out for Azure Stack Hub. So we can cover a little bit about that as well. So there's a lot to cover. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. So are you guys ready? Ready? Yes, let's, okay. yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Right, let's start with the use cases for Azure Stack HCI. So who wants to give us a big... A, a, a big? It could be a big overview if you want, but a high-level overview of the use cases for Azure Stack HCI. Uh, we'll let Darren go for that, seeing as that's his, uh, his, his raison d'etre. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so, I mean, this is a question I get asked often, actually, is the, you know, wh where would I use Azure Stack HCI over Azure Stack Hub, as an example? Um, well, I guess, I guess the, the you know, the, the impending new version of the, uh, Azure Stack HCI is um, it, it's a, it's an Azure delivered hybrid cloud service, right? So it's 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 essentially you should look at it within the realms of a, a you know a cloud conversation or a cloud opportunity uh, rather than just purely on premises, right? And I think I think that's key, and we're going to do, we're going to talk about you know what what connected and disconnected actually means in this realm as well. Um, but from a use case perspective, for me. Um, where I'm seeing, you know, customers having, you know, real interest in Azure, the new version of Azure Stack HCI 20H2 is is the ability to to remain and and uh, you know, remain on premises for the reasons that they need to remain on prem, um, whilst maintaining the skills and experiences and tool sets and automation that they've built up over the years, but opening up the doors and streamlining that use of public Azure services and more cloud native services not just from a technical perspective as well. So all the cool services that we, you know, we know and love in, in public Azure, but also from a commercial perspective now that this is a, it's a subscription based model. So, and, and, and that's what I'm seeing that customers are, you know, excited about is that, you know, now we're moving, you know, albeit we still have, you know, the, the on-premises infrastructure, you know, from a commercial perspective, we're starting to take advantage of that cloud native consumption based or subscription based model 
as well as all the, the goodies that we get um, from an Azure native services perspective as well. And Microsoft have identified sort of specific areas for Azure Stack HCI use cases. And I think, are they called badges? Is that right? Yes. Um, I've seen, so I've seen some of these. So, so some of our slide where we, you know, we, the, what I see out there in some of the use cases, they, they, they tend to mention things like remote branch offices, VDI, yeah. um, and, and these types of things. But, but in reality, we can start really small. So remote branch offices and some of those infrastructures, you know, it, it, you know I, I, I can tend to think about them in sometimes smaller scale. Mm -hmm. But actually, with Azure Stack HCI, very flexible in terms of the shape, size, performance, the SKUs, the, even yeah. the form factors. So we can start really, really small from these small kind of remote branch offices and scale to enterprise enterprise price level from a, from a, again, from a performance and scale perspective. So, you know, the use cases, there's many use cases that, f that fit within that. And I think that's important to, to understand as well, that it's not, not just remote branch offices, not just VDI infrastructures, but anything in between. I think that's so cool about Azure Stack HCI, the fact that you will be able to access this type of technology, the connect, you know, the consistency with Azure, the Azure services, and the sort of consumption-based licensing with as little as two nodes. Like that's quite exciting. And it does exactly. everything right up to um, demanding database workloads. Um, and yeah. one of the use cases, I suppose, that everyone's getting a bit excited about uh, is AKS. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a big for me. I mean, there are so many reasons why AKS and Azure Stack HCI is, is going to be big, massive, super important. I and mean, we'll talk about Azure Arc later, but the way it ties into that uh, is huge. The fact that uh, you can run the AKS and Azure Stack HCI on as small, as Darren says, as two servers, as two nodes, um, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible. That's unique, actually, I think, in the hyper-converged market, being able to be supported in two nodes, I think, for anyone else you have to start at three. So the very small scale footprint um, and the ability to, to, to scale up from there, running um, your Kubernetes services in Azure Stack HCI uh, repeatedly, consistently is is awesome. I mean, I've got uh, AKS deploying into my home lab just now on Azure Stack HCI, and it was it's one command to create my cluster for deploying the Face API Cognitive Service into that. That's nice. That's easy. That's mm -hmm. straightforward. Um, and I'm not that smart a guy, so I need simplicity. I need it to be easy. So do we want to just talk a, a little bit about what exactly AKS is, how it's on what you would use it for in Azure Stack HCI in terms of uh, containers and just sort of give the sort of one-on-one -on -one level of what it is and, and what it will allow you to do. We can. Actually, you know what, would we be able to have a quick discussion and back and forth about um, Azure Stack Hub and Azure Stack HCI still just to, to settle yeah. on yeah. You do them? That would be helpful. <laughs> that's still the most common question I get is, when do I use Hub? When do I use HCI? When do I use Edge? What are these different things for? Where do yeah. they fit in the portfolio? Um, and I guess for me, Azure Stack Hub is, it's very specifically for when you want to use Azure, but you can't. For some reason, you want to run things in the Azure way. So you want to use Azure operational model. You want to use Azure development uh, mechanisms. You want to hire in Azure people to run your Azure workloads and services, but you're not able to do it in a Microsoft data center. And what Azure Stack Hub does is it brings that Azure piece on premises or actually to wherever you want to run it. Um, and it's, it's not just bringing the infrastructure, it's bringing the management plane, it's bringing Azure itself to where you need it um, and to run it. And that's, that's super complex, right? Because running a cloud is not easy. Running a cloud is really hard and Azure Stack Hub makes it pretty straightforward there. Um, but it's very specifically for those Azure workloads and you need to be an Azure um, operator to run it. You need to be able to, to deploy Azure services and run them in the cloud native way. This is not a traditional on-premises virtualization platform. I think that's a really good clarification. So when you were saying like managing and running a cloud is hard, when we say that we are talking a cloud like Azure or, you know, AWS or Google, et cetera. We're talking about that type of cloud. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Whereas Azure Stack HCI, um, oftentimes you can use Azure and you can put things into Azure, but there's a need to run things on premises still, but you can still leverage the Azure management plane. You can still leverage Azure services within there to extend your Azure Stack HCI. But it's also not just about the cloud native services. It's not just about doing things as infrastructure as code or in the Azure native way. It's also about running your heritage applications the same as you always have on premises. So if you have a huge raft of existing applications running in, for example, Hyper-V, 
2012, 2016, something like that, and you want to modernize that, those will happily move wholesale into Azure Tech HCI with no change to how you operate them, uh, how how you, you manage them in terms of even the licensing in, in many cases, it's just yeah. the same. So no need to transform how you do operations to, to start using Azure Tech HCI. And that's a huge thing as well, I think, um, because no need to... the infrastructure can be hard enough. Yeah, exactly. And no need to sort of transform your operations, but actually by moving to, say, say you're not on a hyper-converged infrastructure, so just modernizing that infrastructure maybe taking that approach to start modernizing your teams that manage it um yeah, yeah. but you don't need to change yeah how you run how you license it um any of the workloads and, and you don't need to but the key, the great thing is that because you're now connecting this to azure and um, you can start to take advantage of some of the azure way of doing things so it's a really good way to dip your toe into doing things in the cloud native way start using things like i don't know azure site recovery azure backup azure monitor Azure update management, things like that in the public cloud to extend and enhance your on-premises environment and really start to to dip your toe in the water of how you do things in the cloud native way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great class clarification, Jenny. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) We've answered the question. It's done. We'll just refer people to this section of the the podcast, when to use Hub, when to use Azure Stack HCI, done. You know, the last Azure Stack HCI um, episode or that I did, so it's episode 20, I think is my most listened to episode by far, where we went through all the questions of um, Azure Stack HCI. And those questions are still still out there. So I think the more we talk about it and give examples, um, it's we'll hugely help. popular. Azure Stack HCI is hugely popular. I've, I've, you know, I've been, as you guys know, I've been involved with Azure Stack Hub since, you know, before it went GA, you know, a few years back. And, um, you know, we've built on that momentum. We've learned a lot of lessons from from that, bringing that business to, you know, to the fruition. And the amount of attention that Stack HCI right now is getting is just, it's unbelievable. It's great to see. It's taken up a lot of my time, which is a great problem to have. Yep. So, yep. yes. Yeah, it's good. It is. Good seeing the same. Absolutely seeing the same. Um, and then I guess, Lisa, your question was, where does AKS fit in? Why is this yeah. important? And actually, Darren and I, before this, were just on a call with a customer talking about AKS. Um, and they are rolling their own Kubernetes environment just now. They are building stuff themselves. Their um, their their management don't want to be sort of this, this complexity of rolling your own stuff. They want a repeatable, um, secure way of deploying Kubernetes. They want to use it, but they want to do it in a, a standardized, uh, off-the-shelf, secure, repeatable way. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're talking AKS with them just now. And AKS actually now spans uh, public Azure. It spans Azure Stack Hub. It spans Azure Stack HCI and also in the roadmap for Azure Stack Edge as well. And the question then is, what are you trying to achieve? Where does that AKS workload best live? Um, and that as well is an interesting one. Now, from the, the Hub and HCI perspective, I think pretty straightforward. We covered that off. It's, well, you want to use everything in the Azure way, but you can't do it in the Microsoft data centers. You can't use Azure for management, for example. So you want to bring that full cloud experience on premises and you get uh, AKS there to do that. Azure Stack HCI can use public Azure for management. It can do uh, a bunch of uh, fleet aggregation and uh, and Azure Arc uh, management there of the the Kubernetes workloads there. Um, And also it can start with a much smaller footprint because you don't have the full Azure management plane in there as well. So it's a much uh, lower cost of entry as well for the Azure Stack HCI. Um, Yeah. I think think just just to take that a little bit further as well, so... You know, in addition to all the great management and operational benefits that you get from a an as a service offering an AKS, think about the you know the 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 the, the excellent kind of use cases that, that opens up as well, and where there's, there's starting to be a trend of all things being containerized, right? And even from a Microsoft perspective, Kenny mentioned the Face API a few a few minutes ago. Think about our cognitive services as a native Azure service that's now been containerized. There's lots of those APIs have now been started to containerize, and we can then make them more agile, more flexible. We can run them pretty much anywhere as a containerized platform, but specifically on, you know, managed Kubernetes platforms like 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 can be done on Azure Stack Hub and Azure Stack HCI. So cognitive services is just one. We're going to talk a little bit about Arc later on, um, but again, from the data services piece on Arc containerized SQL managed instance, containerized Postgres hyperscale. You know, so having a, a, a managed Kubernetes environment is future-proofing you and enabling you, getting you ready to 
to to onboard the in a, in a more streamlined and easier fashion these these more cloud native services. In addition to, of course, any containerized apps that you you know any any customer organizations done themselves. But also any traditional applications as well. So if you have things running in VMs, they just run alongside um, within the same Azure Stack HCI environment there. There isn't a, a differentiation drawn between where you run your cloud native, your containerized AKS applications, and where you run your, let's say, Windows Server 2008 virtual machines. Um, hopefully not, but uh, it's it's supported. That's super yeah. powerful, isn't it? And actually, let's just bring the, let's just clarify the 2008 um, being supported and, and what we mean there. So the one of the big announcements is similar to Hub and similar to moving your workloads to Azure. If you're moving 2008 workloads that you've, for whatever reason, not been able to upgrade yet um, and are struggling to, um, if you move those workloads onto Azure Stack HCI 20H2, you get, is it still three years of? Two, two more years. So yeah. it's three years from January from January this year. Yeah. And so um, the, the way that the, the extended support works is that if I wanted to buy the extended support now, I would still have to pay for the um, the time which is gone between now and then. I have to pay for the full three years, even though we've only got two years left, because right. I'm paying for all the patches that came before. Yeah. So we've got two more years to come, but you also get that previous year free as well. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a good point. Um, so you just beat me to it there, is, 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 uh, is making clear that we're well into those three years now, right? Um, so it's just that the clock doesn't start when you when you migrate these workloads. The clock has already started. So if you're if you've not done anything about those right now, you know I, I would seriously consider you know you you're potentially vulnerable or you know we, we you know would be more comfortable if you you know if you took one of the options to to either upgrade, um, refactor, um, or you know migrate them to an Azure solution. So it's not just you know this this started off in public Azure, so Azure Commercial. Then, then the offer was open to Azure Stack Hub. It still is, and now, which is which is great news that it's also open to Azure Stack HCI twenty H two. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to switch up our order that we could just a little bit because we had a great discussion mm -hmm. there about Kenny's clarification around when to use Hub and when to use Azure Stack HCI and whether you can't because of connection reasons. Now, let's mm -hmm. just take a moment to define what disconnected and connected means in terms of both let's just repeat it for Hub and then let's clarify what it means for Azure Stack HCI because that's definitely still a topic that people are, um, people have different uh, definitions, right, of what disconnected actually means and what they need. So let's take a moment yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I can kick this one off if you don't mind, Kenny, you can you can maybe chip in. So, so in in my, my, my experience with Azure Stack Hub, you know, we can, we can, you know, we've, just, we've already discussed it comes with everything that needs to run Azure, um, wherever that might be, you know, on-premises on or wherever. Uh, so it can be connected or disconnected. So we can run those workloads, whether we have a connection or whether even from a security perspective, we need to be completely air gap. So Azure Stack Hub supports both, both of these connection models. Azure Stack HCI 20H2 is a connected, it's an Azure delivered hybrid cloud service. So it's registered and sub you subscribe, you, you register against an Azure subscription. So it's delivered from Azure. It's seen as an Azure resource. It's projected as an Azure resource at the end of the day. So when we say it can't be disconnected, uh, our customers ask, can it be disconnected? My, my, I, you know, I tend to find that they are, they're thinking about the, the use cases of Stack Hub and trying to apply them to Stack HCI. So with Azure Stack HCI, we have to register against an Azure subscription. We have to at least be connected once per month for billing reasons. If we lose connectivity within that month, fine. You know, the cost of the, you know, that your environment on premises or wherever they might be will continue to run. It's absolutely fine. So losing connectivity from a networking perspective is fine. We at least need that at least once per month. However, that disconnected and, uh, you know, it, it does not mean air gapped. So it can't be always disconnected. We can't be completely air gapped from, you know, from, from Azure. It, that's just not what Azure Stack HCI 20H2 is, is, is about. However, if that's what you want, then, you know, we are taking feedback on that. Um, the way I tend to kind of approach these conversations as well is, you know, the benefit, you know, what is Azure Stack HCI? Kenny's talked, you know, explained and articulated quite well what the use cases are and when you would use Azure Stack HCI. If you need to be air gapped, are you really going to be taking advantage of all the best 
that Azure Stack HCI has to offer? Probably not. So therefore, is Azure Stack HCI the best solution for your, you know, for your your business needs? Yeah. And that's the come. I'm getting into a lot of these conversations just by nature of, you know, again the use cases and where Azure Stack Hub shows real value in these secure environments. I, I'm spending a lot of time in those, so I get the same questions. How does that then apply to Stack HCI? Yeah. So very very similar in terms of you know the you know overlapping use cases, but we need to be very specific on you know the connect you know what disconnected and connected actually means in these secure environments. Because with Hub you're bringing the Azure portal with you, so therefore you don't need to connect to anything. With Azure Stack HCI, you're having connect to the Azure portal where your subscription and service runs. I'm just gonna ask a question that I actually don't know the answer to, and I'm sure somebody might ask it in the future. I, I don't think you can now, or would you ever be able to in the future, run Azure Stack HCI connected to Azure Stack Hub? Is that a silly question? It's not a silly question. Not a silly question, no. Um, it, um, it's not something that I think has been publicly spoken about, but it is something that would be really nice. Um, like if you had a, a centralized Azure Stack Hub environment and then dozens of Azure Stack HCI environments scattered around your robo sites, for example, managed from the hub, yeah, it's a great use case. Is it there just now? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just thought that because as you guys were actually just like talking through that and walking through and explaining it, I was like, hmm. Could you yeah. somehow in the future maybe? But okay. it's something I've yeah, hoped I mean, for for a while now, and it comes down back to the the naming as well, actually. So Azure Stack Hub could be and should be your hub for your um, on premises Azure workloads. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and actually, um, just to elaborate a little bit more on that, that will soon come to Azure Stack Edge. So right now, for anyone who's familiar with Azure Stack Edge, it's ordered, consumed, and managed from public Azure. In the future very soon hopefully we will have the ability to do all the same with azure stack hub so we have we, we really do have customers and use cases where yeah. i talked about those air gapped and those completely disconnected environments for security reasons we can have you know a hub being the hub of our own premises or a high you know or you know our hybrid infrastructure with edge devices doing all of the the cool things that the edge device supports you know the the iot scenarios the innovative ai and ml the real-time pre-processing and, 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 and inferencing and all that kind of cool stuff, but completely disconnected in an air-gapped environment. That's so, very cool. You know, it's a valid question going forward. How does that, you know, how can we take a lot of those learnings and what's the use cases and where would we do that with an HCI yeah. environment as well? Yeah. Cool, awesome. Take that on to user voice, Lisa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So have we said all we want to say on these couple of topics? Should we move on to commercials and licensing? I could go for a day or more on this. <laughs> I, saying, yeah. I know, because I was yeah. just like, my head just started working there and I was like, I'm about to start asking more questions. But um, we actually yeah. prepared for this episode, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I think that the, the last thing to think about is that it's not just about the workloads. So the mm -hmm. workloads are important but also the management of it, the operations of it, the governance of it, all of that is super important. And um, with Azure Stack HCI, a lot of that can be managed from public Azure. In Azure Stack Hub, it's managed within the Azure Stack Hub itself. And yeah. looking at those two different planes of the solution it is actually super important. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I actually definitely think that this portion of the episode will be super helpful to everyone. I hope so. I hope so. Like, Certainly, it's not as a clear I said, it's I get. Yeah, it's questions I get very often, and I thought, you know, let's let's just have a discussion about it. So hopefully, it's clear. Um, but yeah, if anyone does have any other questions, let us know. Hit us up um, and ask us. But okay, let's. I, I feel like everyone's avoiding this, the topic of commercials and licensing because it's potentially not the most exciting. Oh, but I love <laughs> we had. Do you know what we had? Uh, we had questions on this in the last episode, and I, they are questions that still remain. So I think we should just, again, try and do what we've done with the other topics and just explain the commercials and licensing of Azure Stack HCI. Yeah. Can I do that? Yeah, Who's you should be very Who's excited. For it, okay. Go for it. You go for it, Santa. Right. <laughs> so um, let's first of all talk about the commercials of Azure Stack HCI as was, the ghost of Christmas past of Azure Stack HCI. 
uh, as it were, everything that's come to now and to the present, um, is basically if you wanted to run Azure Stack HCI, uh, the operating system that you installed was Windows Server 2019 Data Center, and you paid for Windows Server 2019 Data Center licenses on all the, the, the hosts that you ran. With that license, you got all the features of Windows, you got all the features of Azure Stack HCI, and you got your Windows Admin Center uh, licensing as well. And that was that one license that you needed to run absolutely everything. With Azure Stack HCI, it's, uh, as it's relaunching, the, the ghost of Christmas yet to come, um, as it were, uh, it's slightly different. So you don't pay for a Windows Server license for it there. Um, the, the thing that you license is uh, through an, an Azure subscription, you pay $10 per physical core per month uh, while it's running. So if you have um, a two node cluster, each with dual eight core processors, that's $320 per month to run that two node cluster. That is super cheap to run that cluster. And um, that is, that's the cost of it. That's the cost of running Azure Stack HCI there. If you want to run workloads on that, and there can be additional costs. So if you want to run Windows Server virtual machines on that, then you have to pay for those Windows Server virtual machines. Uh, if you run a lot of them, you may pay for that Windows Server data center licensing uh, as well to, to get unlimited virtualization rights. Um, that's, uh, that's a choice. But while with Azure Stack HCI uh, of Christmas past, you had to have that Windows Server license, mm -hmm. with Azure Stack HCI in the future, you actually don't. So if if what you wanted to run was just Linux workloads, actually the, the core use case here I'm, I'm thinking is for AKS. If what you're buying Azure Stack HCI for is AKS specifically to run Linux containers, then there, there is no Windows Server license cost there at all. You're just paying that Azure Stack HCI cost. And if your core use case there is Linux or is AKS on Azure Stack HCI, it may actually be significantly cheaper than uh, the Ghost of Christmas past. Uh, Azure Stack HCI as well. So that for me is super interesting. As we move more to this containerized world and to running Linux and AKS on Azure Stack HCI, there is a lot of cost benefit there as well. And when I say $10 per physical core per month as well, there is no minimum there. It could be as few as one physical core. It's not going to be because you're going to have uh, at least a two node cluster there. But let's say you bought um, two two node cluster with uh, with dual eight core processors in each, but at the start, you only needed a handful of cores there. You can disable a bunch of those unused cores in the BIOS and the UFI uh, and only be reporting on a subset of them and then start bringing them online as you need them. That's a form of uh, as, uh, scale up there within your Azure Stack HCI cluster. So you mm -hmm. can start off super, super small from a hardware and from a licensing perspective and scale it up as you need it. Uh, and that's that's super cool because with the Windows Server version, your minimum was uh, the eight core license packs, right? You can yeah. go smaller now. Yeah. It's flexibility. Oh. Yeah. Very cool. That's, okay. I mean, yeah, I couldn't put that any better myself, to be honest. it's I think you've pretty much covered everything there. Um, maybe the, the, the only other piece was that, you know, so aside to Linux workloads, if you are running Windows guest workloads, if they are few, then we have that option to start with, the, you know, the way we used to, we still do things, start with standard licensing. And then only when that, you know, that, you know, that point is, is reached where there's more VMs, we're using more virtual cores, then, then it's on to data center licensing. But the cool thing is here, we can always start with the lowest, you know, you know, at the lowest bar with standard licensing. And we actually have some customers that's doing that right now because they have resource uh, or intensive, guest workloads running on Azure Stack HCI, so they have fewer VMs running on each of the cluster nodes. So standard licensing is perfect for them. Whereas if they were to move to the kind of traditional model or the, you know, the ghost of Christmas past uh, model, it's data center licensing, that's it, because they need that for the hypervisor, they need it for the software defined elements yeah. of the infrastructure as well. So um, no, that, that's very well put. Um, the way I the way I see the commercials on Stack HCI, and this this is this is very kind of uh, dumbed down, you know, but as, in a you know in a kind of um, uh, just at a very high level, it, I see it in, in three or potentially four main buckets, right? So there's the first piece is the hardware and all the associated costs. The second piece is the Azure HCI subscription model, and the third piece is your you you any guest. Um, or any any licensing that you you bring with you for those guest workloads. The fourth might actually be combined with the the third. There is the support model as well. So the the, the, the Microsoft support model to support uh, Azure Stack HCI. And I guess uh, so that well, might be any um, Azure services you're using to enhance and extend it as well. So if you were using yeah, Azure exactly. Backup or Azure Monitor, Azure Update Management, things like that, that can be an additional say, as well. Yeah, I think and. 
you know, it, that should be play, pretty clear. But I was going to say, is there a fourth or a fifth bucket, which is the Azure services you then consume to enhance those workloads? Um, and yeah. and so is that just standard Azure pricing? So whatever you would pay for those services within Azure, you will pay for them the same with Azure Stack HCI. That's a really deep and interesting question, Lisa, because... We're fire today. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I don't know the answer to that is the, the answer, because when you use some of these hybrid services to manage things on premises just now, say in Hyper-V or in VMware or other environments, there is an on-premises license cost for some of these. Um, if you're using them to, to monitor and manage Azure services, there is not things running in public Azure. They're just included as part of that because they are Azure services. Azure Stack Hub takes advantage of that. So if you have Azure Stack Hub running on premises and you're using some of these public Azure services to, to, to monitor or manage or do things in there, then often that uh, that license cost is waived because they are actually Azure VMs and yeah. they're as such by those services. Yeah. So there's no cost to them. Um, will Azure Stack HCI get the same benefit? I don't know. But I like That's to throw it out there. Every time it comes up, I like to throw it out there just to... That is a good point because Azure Monitor or Azure, you know, tagging, governance, policies, and whatever, they are used to running on Azure VMs, IaaS, Azure IaaS VMs, right? So that's what they've been sort of created to do, and that's what they do, and that's that's it. But if you're then asking them to monitor virtual machines that you have that are not Azure VMs, then it would make sense that, I mean, I could understand why there might be a slightly higher cost. I mean, it would be good if there wasn't, obviously, <laughs> for, for everyone. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. The thing is, even if there is a cost, it's really de minimis. There, there's only a small cost for doing each of these hybrid services. Yeah. Um, and the value, it's probably, you know, the value is there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, th think about, you know, and I don't know the definitive answer to this one either, to be honest, but the, the fact that HCI is projected into Azure as a first class, first class resource, mm -hmm. it is an Azure resource at that yeah. point in time. So you would expect that, you know, um, we, sh we should have benefits there. Um, I can take that one offline outside the podcast. Um, I, I know we're going to come on to, to, um, to ARC eventually, but, you know, um, there's, there's benefits to be had there as well via ARC. So if you've been, for, so if you onboard, a, you know, if you project a server that's on-premises into Azure ARC and you start to utilize, you know, for, for free, you can start to utilize role-based access control, tagging, um, and, and, and organizing via, you know, just the, you know, resource groups and so on. When you start paying is when you start to utilize additional services like policy, log analytics, and so on. However, one of the free um, solution, uh, free services is update manager, update management, which wow. is free for any server that's been projected into Azure via Arc. Update management is free. So like Kenny said, it's there's no one one rule fits all here. I think there's there's definitely there's benefits to be had in, in different types of scenarios. So um, the the hybrid the, you know the hybrid ecosystem is a great place to be at this point in time, yeah. and lots lots of value and lots of benefits for our customers. Let's talk about Arc. Let's do it because I still can quite so. What you just said there makes absolute absolute sense. If you project an on-prem server into Arc, I get that bit. If you project a, a virtual machine that's on an Azure Stack HCI 20H2 into Arc to manage, like where and how do you manage it? Do you manage it through Azure Arc or is because Azure Stack HCI OS is in the Azure, like talk me through that because I'm not quite. Hey, let, let's say 95 plus percent of your management is done in Windows Admin Center. Okay. So all of so your day-to-day -day management activity is done in Windows Admin Center, and that's where we are today. Over time, probably we'll see more of that available within uh, the Azure portal. Will it replace the Azure uh, with the Windows Admin Center? No, because I would expect this leverage in Windows Admin Center to do these things would be my expectation. I'm just guessing. I don't know. And do you... Um, Sorry, on you go. Um, so Azure Arc is there as an aggregation layer, as a, a way to start taking advantage of um, tagging and policy and governance and things like that. But your core management of the platform and the workloads on it is done through Windows Admin Center, I would say. Okay. So to get to take advantage of tagging and logging an update manager, those servers have to be projected to Azure Arc. So, so Arc is baked into Azure Stack HCI um, natively. 
which right. they say a form of a better phrase. Um, so, so yes, and in, in you know in the very near future, following GA, uh, we will have the ability to create, read, manage, update VMs um, from Azure to our Azure Stack HCI clusters wherever they are in the world. And Arc is essentially the brains behind all of that. Right. Um, so yeah. But Arc uh, actually. Uh, if, uh, sorry, a bigger beast. Arc is not just uh, for server uh, management as well. This is where it gets super exciting and interesting for me uh, because Azure Arc, well, it's a suite of capabilities right now. The ones announced are the Azure Arc for servers, which we just touched on, uh, Azure Arc for Kubernetes and Azure Arc uh, for data services are, are the three announced just now. And um, it's, a, it's a portfolio, more, more will come in time given different capabilities. But the Azure Arc for Kubernetes, what that's designed to do is to bring consistency to your um, application deployment across different environments. So if you ever had a Kubernetes workload running in EKS, GKE, AKS, AKSE, lots of different Kubernetes environments, um, you could have one consistent deployment uh, mechanism for that for your developers, for example. So it's not designed to replace the infrastructure. It's designed to bring consistency of deployment uh, across the infrastructures. What AKS is doing for you is bringing consistency to the infrastructure layer. So the Azure Arc for Kubernetes brings consistency across different environments to the developer layer. And AKS is bringing consistency across the infrastructure layer. And together, they make a joyous uh, coupling across AKS across different environments. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, that yeah. does make sense. And that paints a clearer picture in my head. Yeah, I, I read somewhere recently, I'm not sure if it was Twitter or where it was, but someone mentioned about Arc, uh, the Kubernetes element, the Kubernetes kind of pillar as being the, 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 the Kubernetes manager of managers, essentially, mm -hmm. um, which kind of got me thinking for a few minutes, like, ah, it kind of makes sense. But, but yeah, it's very cool. And actually, just to expand on that, I think some of the benefits, actually, we, we should probably highlight for Azure Stack Hub customers are you know, any organizations thinking about Azure Stack Hub and, and Azure, uh, or, or, or sorry, Arc, is Kenny mentioned some of the, the Kubernetes, the, the at scale Kubernetes app management. The data services piece as well is going to be hugely uh, advantageous to our, our Stack Hub customers as well as HCI, of course, but, but Stack Hub. You know, think about an as a service data offering, being able to be run on Stack Hub um, and managed, you know, uh, and, and even even supported completely disconnected as well. So we will have a disconnected model for data services, which means that our Stack Hub customers can take full advantage of that. Uh, and some of our secure Stack Hub customers are at that as well. So very, very exciting place to be. And again, testament to, you know, the, how important uh, and how, how much of a priority hybrid is mm -hmm. um, you know, to us at Microsoft, certainly, and, 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 and you know, our partners. Yeah, and then why is the... Sorry, go, 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 Lisa. I was just going to say, I'm super happy to hear that. You know that I don't want to leave Hub behind. <laughs> I don't want Hub to be left behind. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's good to hear. Incredibly important. Together. So, so why is data services important for me? Um, well, one of the things I said earlier is that we have to look at the, the sort of the data plane and the management plane separately. And one of the things that we also have to remember about data in particular is that it's often sticky and it's hard to move. Um, and that if you have a large amount of data, it often sticks to where it is and things develop around it. Um, but at the same time, you want to take advantage of things like um, Azure SQL managed instances or Azure PostgreSQL or other Azure data services. Um, and you can't necessarily deploy them into public Azure because the data exists or is being generated elsewhere. What Azure Arc for Data Services lets you do is deploy that service wherever you want to need it and still manage it from Azure. So you split out the data plane and the management plane there. You put the data generation, aggregation, and, um, and deployment where it needs to be. And then you manage it in the same way as you would just in the, the Azure service in public Azure. And there really isn't a difference there. But uh, the way it deploys is to a Kubernetes cluster. So your prerequisite for deploying these data services is to have a Kubernetes cluster. So you can do it on Azure Stack Hub with AKS. You can do it on Azure Stack HCI with AKS. You can do it in the future on Azure Stack Edge potentially with AKS there, where you choose to deploy these data services is not constrained anymore. It's just wherever you have one of these environments, any of them, um, you can then push these data services to, generate that data there, and manage it with the Azure tooling exactly as you would if it was being stored in public Azure. That's massively powerful for me. And what still blows my mind is, 
Azure Arc is taking this capability not just to the Azure Stack family, right? It's yeah, it's anywhere you have Kubernetes. Anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Or anywhere if you have so Azure Arc for services, any virtual machine. Any Windows or Linux virtual machine yep. or physical server. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You, you install an agent. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Darren. Yeah, you install the agent. yeah, you install the agent and you project it into Azure and, and that's you know it enables up a whole raft of um native Azure capabilities and yep. services. And and that's the, the important thing for me is that Azure Arc is not replacing anything in Azure Stack Hub or Azure Stack HCI. It's enhancing it. It is yeah. bringing the management plane and the governance plane to other locations, but that infrastructure piece um, and how that's managed, deployed, delivered is is super important. And that's what um, Azure Stack HCI and Azure Stack Hub are delivering for you there. So they work together in harmony. They do. It's a better together story. And actually one of my favorite things about Azure Stack HCI is that it is a better together story with Azure. So oftentimes we'll get people thinking that uh, hybrid um, Azure services are in conflict with Azure. It's because you don't want to use Azure or because um, you, you can't use Azure for some reason. Azure Stack HCI is made better when you have Azure in region. And if you are using Azure, Azure Stack HCI is a, a significantly better proposition when connected there. It is, uh, it is an Azure service, deploying Azure services where you need them to be. It's awesome. Yes, I love it. Awesome. Yes. It is all coming together, isn't it? Like it was all yeah. planned by Microsoft in advance. <laughs> planned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kenny is, for those that are listening, Kenny is currently making a, what would you describe that? Not a straight line process. It's a, a wending and weaving river, eroding yeah. things on its path, but still making its way to where it needs to get to. Oh my God, you and your um, analysis, <laughs> love it. <laughs> okay, guys, so actually I'm going to hand over to Kenny. I'm going to hand over to Kenny to talk about WS Lab. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, WS Lab has made my life so much easier for Azure Tech HCI. Um, but first I'm going to describe my, my Playgrounds development environment. My okay. Playground development environment is uh, a one new physical server. It is uh, a Dell R640 with a bunch of CPU and RAM and storage in it. Um, nothing special, nothing too fancy. Um, and I use it for playing with and testing both Azure Stack Hub and Azure Stack HCI concurrently. And the way that I do that is that I have Hyper-V installed on this, um, this R640 and I have uh, a bunch of VMs in there running as nested virtualization. One of those VMs is for running the Azure Stack development kit. So within that single VM, on this single physical server, I can run a full Azure Stack um, development kit environment, which gives me every single feature that I want to play with inside the Azure Stack Hub environment there. Super awesome. Um, and actually all of my previous blogs about how to open up networking on it still apply to this as well. So we can still open up the networking into this VM. I don't have to do it as a physical server. I can do it as I want within a VM there. Um, and actually it makes it much, much easier for redeployment as well, because redeployment of a VM, much, much easier than redeployment of a physical server. Mm -hmm. So from an Azure Stack Hub perspective, I have one VM on this host and that gives me everything I need there. For Azure Stack HCI, um, I run a four node Azure Stack HCI cluster a nested VM cluster within there um, with a domain controller and uh, a Windows Admin Center server in there as well. And the way that I spin that up and, and down and redeploy and, and smash it and scale it and destroy it and play with it is with WS Lab. And WS Lab is a, a series of scripts and scenarios um, uh, which make it super simple to test and deploy Azure Stack HCI. So all you do is you go to github.com slash Microsoft slash WS Lab. You download a series of scripts, which are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You run them in sequence. You just go click, 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 click. You can make a couple of changes if you want, like the, the size of your virtual machines, the, the number that you're running, the naming of them, some of those things. But really the idea is that you can just go click, 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 next, 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 run all these uh, these scripts and they will deploy an Azure Stack HCI cluster for you. The, the minimum footprint that you need, the minimum spec that you need for your physical server or laptop there is I think uh, eight gigs of RAM and 40 gigs of hard drive space, you can deploy an Azure Stack HCI cluster for testing on an eight gig laptop with 40 gigs of hard drive space. It's next to nothing. So it's really designed to be super simple to deploy. Mm -hmm. um, and then after you've deployed the, the core infrastructure there, the core cluster, you choose what scenario you want to deploy. So there's a whole raft of scenarios within the WS Lab Git, uh, GitHub, and you choose what you want to do. So for example, if you wanted to deploy AKS in Azure Stack HCI OS, you choose the scenario for that, 
You take the script for that, you run it, you let it go. When it's finished, you have AKS running there. Simple as that. You want to do a different scenario, you want to try a different number of uh, VMs, you want to, to change up your cluster a bit, destroy it, run your scripts again, you have a new cluster there, try a different scenario. Basically, anything you want to test in Azure Stack HCI, old or new, um, and the AKS service within there as well, and connecting it into Azure Arc in beta uh, is available within this super simple, easy to use, easy to consume uh, repository there, get going. Even better, that's all from a nested virtualization perspective. There's also now the capability to, to use the, the, the Windows Deployment Toolkit, the Bare Metal Deployment Toolkit, to do this on Bare Metal as well. So if you have a small scale Azure Stack HCI cluster and you want to deploy it through automation repeatedly, consistently, uh, you can do that with WS Lab as well. It's amazing. And we'll put uh, maybe some links to that in the description, how you can use it, link to Jeremy on, uh, on Twitter as well so that he can get a bunch of traffic yeah. there and people yeah. thanking him because it is just, it's so nice just being able to go next, 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 there's my lab. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, definitely send me those links and I'll put them in the description. Um, and I love it. Um, so the fact that you've got the ASDK to test hub and you've got WS Lab to test Azure Stack HCI. And I think we spoke about this before in our episodes, we would highly suggest that you do that um, when you're thinking about um, these technologies. Like it's like you just said, it's so easy. Why would you not? And test so that you can plan for, for how you're going to use them. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. I like it. Darren, do you want a I mean, WS Lab I, for your Christmas? I, 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 I do. I know what I want even more uh, as a prereq is uh, one of those one new servers, Kenny. Oh. <laughs> I can like having, having these servers, Platinum 8260 procs and 768 gigs of RAM and some SSDs makes life quite quite joyous. Come work at yeah. Dell. No, same yeah. with our Microsoft. We're a good team. <laughs> as a partner, I think you should uh, you should <laughs> with, uh, as, uh, with one of those servers, Kenny. Maybe we'll see remote access. Yeah. yeah. Um, Shoot it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I guess slightly changing tracks. I think we we're going to talk a little bit about um, the, the a little bit about Azure Stack Hub actually. Um, and I, you know, on the you know a kind of similar kind of scenario in the sense that you know I'm still asked about how, how can I get started on Azure Stack Hub. You know, so so Kenny's mentioned about the SDK and how easy it is to install inside WS Labs on you know some 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 hardware there. Um, there is lots of foundational information as well, foundational materials that we've been continuously keeping up to date um, over you know the, more than a well more than a year now. I'm sure. Um, so if, if I can't remember the exact link, but you know favorite search engine, you know just have a search for Azure Stack Hub foundational, um, and you will get a, you know a link to GitHub which then has lots of um, slides, workshops, and a video series as well that's on YouTube at this point in time. So, um, you know, to back up the environment that you, you've you got physically with w, w, or virtually with WS Labs and, and the Azure Stack Development Kit, there's lots of materials as well to, to, to back that up and, and get you get you started, um, which which kind of might lead us into, Kenny, the, the, the center of excellence. Center of excellence, oh, yeah. You can talk about it. Well, so um, Dell and Microsoft and our partners, Ordinaro IT, have collaborated to put together a, basically a best of breed environment for um, customers and partners to test their Azure Stack uh, Hub workloads in. So we have a center of excellence at uh, azurestack-coe.com, uh, which you can sign up for proof of concepts. You can also do validation as a service. So if you're an ISV who has uh, an Azure Marketplace item and you want to test if that will work in Azure Stack Hub, we operate a validation as a service offering out of there as well um, to allow you to do this. And this is running on um, an eight node, all flash, really high performance, really best of breed Dell Azure Stack Hub within uh, a really incredibly well-managed environment there. Um, it is it's pretty much showcasing Azure Stack Hub at its best, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. That is exciting. Yeah. I don't know why we've all paused. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. We're just in maybe, all yeah, that was, that maybe, was we're, maybe we're all in yeah. shock as to how great this is. No, it is, it is awesome. Um, 
homework for both of you is to send me all these links and addresses so that I get them all right and they're all in the description. Um, so Kenny, do you just visit that website and then is there instructions on how you can... Yeah, there's a form you can fill in on the website in German and in English. Um, awesome. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's a really powerful offering both for customers and for ISVs. Um, and Dino does a great job, like you say, of... Uh, of managing them so that you can just focus on what it is well, that you Dino operates this as a production environment. So you know that when you're testing your workloads on it, this is as as it would be in production. This is yes. managed as it should be and would be when running live. It's not um, just a, a bit of spare tin that someone had lying off to the sides that you can see, eh, this is kind of what it's like. This is showcasing the best of Azure Stack Hub. Yeah. Yeah. yeah awesome okay so lastly do we want to just do a quick fire update on the 2008 update for azure stack hub we have vnet peering we have vnet peering indeed one of the most requested features since uh since you know since the early days of azure stack hub um so yeah great to have that finally uh finally available when customers already start to take advantage of it so yeah eases the the, the management and operation configuration even of you know jumping from you know virtual network to virtual network and um, within your azure stack hub um uh, user space so yeah uh, it's, a, it's a nice feature and uh you know it's very welcome for sure i remember at microsoft ignite the tour of london not this year but the year before Darren and I, we did a yes. session there about um, networking in Azure Stack Hub, and there was a significant portion of that dedicated to how you get around the lack of VNet peering there, because it was probably one of the most asked things about Azure Stack Hub. Well, now there is no need to get around it. It's just built in, and that exactly. saves us all a lot of uh, time and effort, and, and yeah, that's uh, yeah, good. Awesome. Um, so, so maybe not quite related to the, the you know the latest version and some of the release notes and so on. Um, but there's a couple of previews maybe I want to highlight. So AKS um, is in private preview right now. So there's there's forms that you can fill in if you if you want to register and see if you can get onto that. Um, and also IoT Hub in public preview right now. It's available in the marketplace on Azure Stack Hub. Um, so you know if you've got those edge use cases. Um, and you, you know, you, you've got latency um, requirements where, you know, a hub, you know, capturing with IoT Hub running on Azure Stack Hub, capturing those and ingesting those device, uh, device and other telemetry, then, you know, it's, it's potentially a compelling solution for you and very, very easy to, um, to, to download and install um, on Azure Stack Hub. So a um, cu couple of just shout outs for, for those two preview features for me. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Good one, Darren. Um, okay, guys. Well, shock horror. We've managed to speak for an hour mm. about Azure Stack. Can we go for another hour? <laughs> we will have a follow-up session, as we always do, early next year. So if you've got any questions following this, um, this episode, let us know. We will do our best to answer them. Um, obviously answer you directly in real time. You don't need to wait until the next episode, but we'll keep the questions for the next episode. And um, I just want to say, guys, well, I suppose I should say Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Hey, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, hope have a, I hope you have a great COVID-compliant Christmas celebration. <laughs> we will. We will do, of course. Okay, guys, thanks again so Thank much. You. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.